So welcome back to uh, our Overburden Programming Weekend. Before we get started, I just want to um, give it a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge with gratitude that our galleries are located on the unceded ceded traditional territory of the Snake States, uh, Arrow Lakes, and <laughs> Yakanuki Lower Indian Band peoples in Nelson, and the unceded traditional territory of the Snake uh, Arrow Lakes people in Castlegar. We would like to thank both the Snakes and Yakinuki um, and the many diverse Indigenous Metis Meti people who are who live here now for the opportunity to live, work, and host cultural experiences like this one within this beautiful watershed. So, uh, welcome. And the artists in the second panel, Imaginaries, Speculative and Embodied Ways of Relating to Rock, Mineral, and Mountain, use language, performance, drawing, and sculpture to explore our relationship with rock, mineral, and landscape, both real and speculative. Jim and Darren will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes together, and then Randy, Asiniak, and Keith will speak to, for 10 to 12 minutes. We will then have um, a question, I'll ask a question for the panel, and then we'll have time for your questions and comments after the uh, after the group panel. So I'll turn it over to Natasha to go over some of the house rules. Hello, Natasha. everybody. <laughs> so if I could ask everyone to please stay muted. Um, and we do have live captioning available. Um, just one second. Um, the video is being recorded, so only turn on your camera if you feel comfortable. If you'd like to, sorry, to turn on the live captioning, uh, there's a live transcript button at the bottom in the toolbar. We will have a question and answer at the end of the event, um, and you can post questions in the chat or message Oxygen Art Centre privately. Um, and then we will, uh, we can, you can message them uh, throughout the event or at the end. Um, the questions will be read out in the order that they're received. Okay, thanks, thanks Natasha. So um, I just want to say welcome. I see lots of other artists here. And also I see Deanna Peters who um, designed our gorgeous website. So thank you so much, Deanna. I'll say that while you're here. So, um, but let's get on to the panel. So first, um, Dr. Darren Fleet and Jim Holyoke both grew up in Alder Grove, BC. Since high school, they have been companions in wandering and creative writing. For over 20 years, they have maintained a practice of writing together that they call 856ing, trademark. The name based upon the regional telephone code of their former suburban lives. For eight minutes and 56 seconds, or for one hour beginning at 8.56 p.m., they sit together in silence, generating free associative writing, which they share afterwards. Darren Fleet's creative journalistic and scholarly work has been featured in numerous publications and forums, including Vice, Public, Frontiers in Communication, Journalists for Human Rights, Utney Reader, and at the Istanbul Biennale of Art. He is interested in the way that fossil fuels mediate and define our relationships with the non-human world and with one another. Jim Holyoke's discipline consists of book arts, ink painting, and room-sized drawing installations. He received a BFA from U the University of Victoria, an MFA from Concordia University, and studied ink painting in Yangshui, China. Though the content of his work ranges from the biological to the phantasmagorical, there is a persistent interest in human empathy for species and in the challenge of fathoming deep time. Jim has exhibited his work, contributed to publications and has attended art residencies internationally. Uh, Jim also has a solo exhibit coming up in 2022 at the Kootenai Gallery of Art. So uh, with that, I pass it over to Jim and Darren. 
Okay, I'm just going to load up the PowerPoint here. Oh, it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. Here we go. All right, Darren, ready when you are. Yeah, just one sec. Uh, okay, here we go. So just a technical note, uh, Jim and I will be sharing speaking in real time and Jim is in control of the slideshow and we will be exchanging voice throughout. So uh, hopefully this works out well. Um, so greetings, uh, it's wonderful to be part of such an amazing panel and an amazing show. Uh, and it's one that I think wrestles and engages with um, one of the most important issues of our time, which is how to make sense uh, of life on a planet that's being destroyed by systems of human creation and how to consider life in the dissonance of this knowledge and the ways that we are implicated. Uh, a special thanks to, to Maggie Shirley and Genevieve Robertson for bringing together such an excellent array of artists and creators under the guise of this important topic and to Patty Bailey for that wonderful and informative keynote address. Uh, my name is Darren Fleet. I'm presently uh, presenting today from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And our work we're presenting today and in the show is titled Trilobites Above the Fog, which you can see on the screen. Uh, it's a collection of 40 plein air drawings, writings and comic pages based upon several treks in the Columbia Basin uh, in Kootenai, Sanangs, uh, Yakanuki, Arrow Lakes, and Sepawenich First Nations traditional territory. The work itself is, is, an, is an ode, it's a critique, uh, and a recognition of a range of ideas and concepts, including deep time, of climate change, of extraction, and also a personal engagement with the current moment of extinction. It attempts to capture the very real and the often conflicted res ecological responses that we have to the contemporary crisis. And one of the primary modes used in the work to do this is humor. And human laughter or humor and laughter is one of the ways that we engage with grief and loss and culpability, absurdity, and even powerlessness. And in these works, we present a set of personal conversations between Jim and I, transported across deep time more than 500 million years ago on planet Earth, where we are personified as a pair of trilobites, Douglas and George, which you can see on the screen. Those names are based on Jim and I's middle names, and they're seen here side by side, who themselves are trying to make sense of their world, the Cambrian, which also ended in a mass extinction event, though an extinction event not of their making. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. And of course, uh, those of you who are familiar with the history of Romanticism as a literary and artistic form will immediately recognize the inspiration for this image that is the cover page of Trilobites Above the Fog as a playful take on Caspar Friedrich's um, Wanderer Above the Sea Fog, which is an archetypal kind of romantic era image painted in 1818 two years after a major and sudden climactic cooling event, sometimes called the year without summer. And at times this work that, that we're going to be presenting uh, reflects aspects of the lingering influence of romanticism in our culture. And in particular, how many of us view and understand the non-human world and mountainous landscapes as sites of inspiration, renewal, insight, and to experience a sense of the sublime, to be in the presence of the overwhelming expanse of our world and maybe even to find some slight relief in the feeling of our smallness. Next slide, please, Jim. And so here we are, I'm on the left, my left anyway, Jim's on the right in that great orange suit, uh, <laughs> uh, going into the landscape on a couple of trips that we used as inspiration to consider the idea of overburden, what it is, how it is, why it is. This is uh, us on a hiking trail to Kokanee Glacier, one of the scenes for the journey you're about to travel with us. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. And here is a view looking out from the Walcott Quarry and the mountains of Yoho National Park near the BC Alberta border, home of the most significant fossil find in human history, a find that transformed the way we think about the origins of life on Earth. But before going further into a discussion of both the making of the work and some of the ideas that inform it, 
uh, we thought we would narrate for you one of the comic panels uh, from the collection as a way of introducing you to the characters of the Cambrian era and to the work itself. Uh, next scroll, next image, Jim. So this is Doom Scroll, uh, and it's a comic panel that explores the comfort and the absurdity of what critical scholars would call or could call the Petro familiar. I will start. So I was doom scrolling through the news. Uh huh. And there was this story. Mm hmm. And it was about how oil prices have bounced back to pre pandemic levels. And there was this sense to the story that everything is, is going to be okay. Hmm. Because oil is going to be okay. Whoa, so beautiful. Yes, beautiful. I can't believe this is here. I can't believe we're here. It's fucking beautiful. Seriously. Boom. <laughs> so this is the beginning of my part. Um, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jim Holyoke. Um, I'm zooming in today from Salt Spring Island, uh, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Saanich, Cowichan, and Shemanis First Nations. Um, Randy, Asinia, Keith, it's so nice to meet you all. Um, uh, so I'd like to begin the next segment with a story that began one evening in 1997 when Darren and I met each other by chance while riding a public bus between Langley on our way to our hometown, uh, Aldergrove. Um, I'm a year older than Darren, so though we were at the same high school, we weren't in the same classes, but we'd had the same high school creative writing teacher whose name is Mr. Nelson. And we recalled on the bus how Mr. Nelson spoke about having a, a weekly writing circle with a friend of his at a cafe at which they'd sit in si silence and write spontaneously for an hour and then share what they'd written. So on that bus ride, Darren and I decided to give it a try. And for 24 years now, we've been meeting up regularly to write together. And we call this process 856, 856ing after the Alder Grove's 856 phone code. Um, our friendship is based in writing together, but also in traveling and wandering around, hiking, cross-country skiing, and talking, thinking out loud together. Uh, here's a page uh, from, our, uh, from a series of zines that I wrote about my adolescence and pub self-published in the early 2000s. It's called Monsters for Real. Uh, in this page, uh, Darren and I are depicted in an altered state of mind in a parking lot at the Schwartz Bay Ferry Terminal. Um, an important habit that I picked up from my friendship with Darren is to always carry a pen and a notebook in my pocket because you never know when you're gonna get a good idea or a bad idea or forget one. And I've been doing this ever since I made friends with Darren and as well as keeping a diary, which Darren also does. Uh, for both of us, these disciplines are, the hidden, are part of the hidden understory to the other things that we do. Darren's known to even sleep with a notebook next to his pillow in case he wakes up with an idea. And I even bring a notebook into the swimming pool and keep it at, at the end of the lane so that I can jot down thoughts what, that occur to me while swimming. Um, the most intense of here, actually I'm gonna step back. The most intense of time Darren and I had writing together was in the summer of 2006, when we were studio mates here on Salt Spring and wrote every night together for the entire summer, starting at 8.56 p.m. until about 10 p.m. And during the pandemic, we've been meeting once a week by Zoom and writing together for at least eight minutes and 56 seconds while storyboarding the pages for Trilobites Above the, the Fog, which is our first ever uh, official collaboration. So about time. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, in the summer of 2019, Darren and I went hiking together into the Burgess Shale regions of Eastern BC along with some friends, including Andrew Godsalve, who's in the crowd today. Hello, uh, hello, Andrew. Um, the Burgess Shale is a World Heritage Site and can only be accessed on organized field trips with professional geologists and paleontologists. The fossils there are from the Cambrian period and are about 508 million years old. Uh, here's a, you can see a camera trap watching out for fossil thieves. 
even though the Smithsonian has already taken the best specimens. And here's a picture of Darren and I writing and drawing on plein air. Um, Uh, as we walked, I'd spent a lot of time sketching both the microcosm of fossils, bugs, and plants, and also from the mountains. Uh, here are a few of those mountain drawings. Uh, my practice almost always blends together imagination and observation. So it's normal for me to make a drawing outside and, and bring it into the studio. In this case, I added fragments of text that uh, Darren and I co-wrote together during 856 sessions. I'll read to you, to, uh, to you the middle one. As soon as the oceans condensed out of the clouds, life emerged. Amino and nucleic acids coalesced into biochemical strands of agency and thought. Meanings were created, bonds were formed, futures were born, loved and devastated. And then life as we once knew it, sunk into an oceanic crater eight kilometers below the mud. So some of these show, uh, works are, are at Kootenai Gallery. Uh, here's a photo of me uh, at the Mount Stevens trilobite beds making graphite rubbings from trilobite fossils. Um, when you're walking around up there, you can pick up almost any random stone and find fossils or fossil fragments. I, I could hardly believe that we we're allowed to be there walking around. Our, our guide said you just get used to it. Um, there's so many unlikely things about this. I take special conditions for a creature to be fossilized at all. And then after 508 million years of being underground, the seafloor is pushed up 2.3 kilometers um, back to the air where forces of erosion expose those fossils. And meanwhile, humans evolved and happened to find these fossils and make some sense out of them in the geo geological blip of time before these fossils are eroded again by weather and are gone forever without a trace. So here's a few of those um, trilobite rubbings and some photos of the fossils we picked up there, giving you a sense of their, their scale and their size. Um, and here's a photo of a fossilized anomalocaris mandible, which originally was mistaken as a creature in its, uh, of its own. Um, anomalocaris was the apex predator of the Cambrian, uh, about 38 centimeters long. It was a really large creature for the time. So the Cambrian period lasted from 541 million years to 485 million years ago. And somewhere in the midst of that was an event called the Cambrian explosion which was the greatest diversification event that ever happened on earth. This was the opposite of a mass extinction. It was a time, a time period when nearly all the phyla and body structures of creatures living today first evolved, plus all kinds of strange animals with no living relatives. And here's the view from the Mount Stephen trilobite bed down to the town of Field, BC. And I think I'm especially drawn to, to this place because of um, all my life, I've been interested in animals of all their varieties, living in extinct, real and imaginary. And so I dropped this slide in, it's a film still, it's, a, it's kind of a side note from an anime that it was inspiring to me called Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, which was written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. It's a sci-fi in which the people have to wear masks to protect themselves from toxic spores and meanwhile, that the monsters are all based on creatures from the Cambrian period. So here's a picture of Darren and I during a, a, a Zoom uh, 856 uh, meeting where Darren is uh, storyboarding um, the first page of, the, of our comic book. And here's my, my storyboard uh, of a different comic, which shows how you don't need to be good at drawing even to storyboard uh, comic book pages. Um, here's another page uh, where on the right you can see uh, my uh, eight minutes and 56 seconds of spontaneous writing. And on the left side is an idea for the first page of a new comic. You'll see up here, um, there's, there's two trilobites in a shallow sea at the top of an underwater cliff. It's warm and luminous and oxygenated up here. And down here, it's cold and dark and anoxic. So here's the comic. 
where George and Douglas are going for a walk and fall off of the cliff. Um, and this illustrates how the fossils in the Burgess Shale were preserved, which is something I learned from the ge our geologist guide, is that if the trilobites had died up here, they would have been um, eaten or decomposed. If they'd fallen too far down, they would have been crushed by the weight. But having fallen in the shadow of the cliff in the slope, they were covered with marine sediment and fossilized. Uh, so this, this comic illustrates this process of the trilobites falling, dying, being preserved, and eventually coming back uh, into uh, the surface. Um, so yeah, here we go. In, uh, they landed on the slope in the shadow of a cliff and were covered in sediment. And from there rode a tectonic wave for a few million years back to the surface. And then all of a sudden, it's back to you, Darren. Thank you, Jim. That's wonderful. Uh, on this slide here uh, is one of the, I guess that is Douglas uh, repeating the, uh, the, the statement made to me by my uh, English 12 teacher in high school. Uh, so here we want to just talk briefly about the cultural dimensions of overburden. And so the work primarily takes up the task of overburden, not just as the bycatch of oil sands extraction, kind of the top of the forest that scraped away to capture the bitumen beneath, but as a psychological and cultural phenomenon. The ways that extinction, extraction, systems of provision implicate us and attempt to implicate us in their legitimation and their continuance. And so it documents how these two Cambrian characters wrestle with contested understandings of choice, the burden of choice, and the failure of choice to produce meaningful change as the two gigantic titans of our present clash, which is the planet and economic growth. Um, so I want to show you four brief works that to me capture the essence of what I see trilobites above the fog doing. Next slide, please, Jim. Why was I born? In this comic, uh, George is recounting a fundamental existential and spiritual anxiety of his youth, one that finds parallels in his contemporary feelings towards extinction and extraction. Why was I born? Why am I here? Is there a God? Is there a universe? Am I going to hell? Am I going anywhere? God, this is awful. And it's awful in the sense that these questions are a constant background noise of life. And they find parallel in the contemporary climate moment. In one instance, you are contemplating the purchase of a particular product at the grocery store. And then the next, you have flashes of the entire system of inequities, both human and ecological, that go into even the basic things on the store shelf, things that have become necessary to participate in this culture. Next slide, please, Jim. Here, uh, an anomalocaris faces a similar burden but this one in relation to the rapid processes of destruction and accumulation. It finds parallels in social movement exhaustion or the stinging defeats of gentrification or the consumptive inertia of middle age, of being in a world where it's so difficult to practice alternative ways of being or to, and to live beyond the reach of petroculture. The anomaly Lacaris says, I feel like a ghost. Everything around me is being destroyed. I've given up fighting because I don't want to go on wearing armor anymore. It's too heavy. Next slide, please, Jim. Uh, this one I had written, this is disregard is a symptom and an action of extinction. I kind of composed a much larger reflection on this for you today, but actually I thought I would just kind of leave it as that statement, uh, as something to sit with uh, and that I sit with and to consider the discomfort of this idea right, the implication in our own lives and to consider how the temptation to disregard and the categories of those things considered disregardable um, or expendable or worthless or undeserving of care or attention or concern are constantly enveloping us and are products of the most ideas of our, of the most dominant ideas of our time. Next slide, please, Jim. And finally, our last one, which is this. Uh, Jim and I will- my truth. <laughs> oh. Sorry, go right Sorry, ahead. Sorry, Darren. Are you, you on your go okay. Yeah. Wild is my truth. Wild is my post truth. Thank God for this beautiful place we're destroying. Well, thank God for this beautiful planet we're destroying. And by we, I mean we in this place. And by we in this place, I mean some people in this place. 
And by some people in this place, I mean, some people are more responsible than others. I don't want to be eaten. I don't want to be eaten either. So the first line of this exchange is something my six-year-old daughter told me in real life, which is wild is my truth, uh, which is represented here as a bit of a playful political banter between Douglas and George. After which they then have a discussion about what eco-Marxist scholar Jason Moore calls in his own words, a trick as old as modernity, the rich and powerful create problems for all of us. And then they tell us we are all to blame. And this offers a bit of insight into my research as a communications and media scholar, which primarily focuses on the role of the personal within the context of collective action problems. How the internalization of guilt around the eco crisis can both reinforce dominant narratives of extraction and ecocide, but also possibly fuel different ways of considering and acting on the scale of our own individual lives, which while meaningful to us, uh, most often, if not most always, serves generally no purpose against the, the systemic forces we challenge. And then their conversation ends. I don't want to be eaten. I don't want to be eaten either. Which is where our characters eventually find themselves on their journey across deep time, simultaneously motivated, enamored, terrified, and paralyzed by the psychological overburden of participating in destroying the very things that they love when their deepest desire is simply to live. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Jim and Darren. That was absolutely uh, fascinating and fun. Um, and um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things. Um, I'm just going to say that um, we're going to leave questions until the end of the session. And so we'll. Um, if you have some questions for Jim and Darren, please um, write them down or make note of them and we'll, we'll, um, you'll have time to ask them at the end. So um, we'll move into the next speaker who is Randy Lee Cutler. Randy Lee Cutler is an interdisciplinary artist whose practice weaves together themes of collaboration, uh, ecology, materiality, science and fiction taking the form of walks, performance, collage, printed matter, installation, video, audio, and creative writing, she has produced new, numerous hybrid projects that engage with conversation and research. Exhibitions and performances include the Biennale of Sydney, NIRN -N, NIRN 2020, Belkin Art Gallery, Vancouver Art Gallery, oh, 7A asterisk 11 Deep International Performance Art Festival and Visualize Festival of Performance Art, among others. She has published an elemental typology, art, an artist book, exploring cultural configurations of minerals in philosophy, mining, science, and spirituality, as well as an e-book, e Open Wide, an ABC Darium for the Great Digestive System, available on iTunes. Her current research, a Shirk Insight funded project, sorry, a Shirk Insight funded project called Leaning Out of Windows, Art and Physics Collaborations Through Aesthetic Transformations, explores how artists and scientists work together to develop a shared understanding of knowledge and how it is translated across their disciplinary communities. Randy is professor at Emily Carr University in the Faculty of Art, on unceded Coast Salish territories, also known as Vancouver, Canada. So uh, Randy, with that, please um, welcome to uh, Overburden. Thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you to Jen as well, to um, Kootenai Gallery and Oxygen um, Art Center for um, organizing this beautiful exhibition and this panel. I really appreciate being here among such uh, wonderful artists, um, hard act to follow, um, you too. I feel like it's relevant here for me to say that my address growing up was 856. <laughs> so there might be some deeper connection that we need to explore, perhaps at a later date. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to start my slideshow. Okay, so um, I'm coming to you from the um, um, unceded uh, 
territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples uh, in Vancouver, Canada. And I, um, yeah, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context of my practice, which relates specifically to the works in the exhibitions um, that we're, we're, we're exploring. So my practice is diverse and interdisciplinary, um, but it always involves research and materiality and connecting to the broader context, namely the more than human world. By this, I'm invested in animals, and by animals, I mean humans as well as other creatures, uh, plants, rocks, and invisible forces, including gravity, magnetism, and dark matter, to name three. There are more. So a question I might ask is how might artwork be science fictional? I'm interested in how ideas and practices can be accessed and reconfigured for emergent and speculative readings, as well as how objects and experiences are assembled and composed in relation rather than as discrete entities. So a question I ask here is how are we always in relation to others, sentient and otherwise? This collage that you're looking at is part of a series of images that I made for the Sydney Biennale near in 2020. Um, it's part of a larger project called Mineral Collection, which uh, explores the presence of minerals in our daily environments and their profound but often unacknowledged effects on our experiences. Using a variety of media and participatory events at the Sydney Biennale, the project maps the physical structures, geographies, and biologies or biological effects of a number of core minerals, showing how they work as the invisible building blocks of our bodies and our technologies. Um, so each component of mineral collection is a geological dig across a physical and a metaphorical spectrum, connecting and rupturing familiar meanings and assumptions. This multifaceted approach offered audiences a nonlinear encounter with mineral formations from the past, the present, and the future to better contemplate interactions with these earthly deposits. I should also say that uh, as part of my project in Sydney, I worked with um, Andrew Rewald, an artist who also was invested in um, questions about minerals. For him, it was um, often about gardening and the ways in which minerals can be put into the earth through plants, but also taken out of the earth through plants. So that was a really exciting collective project, which sort of relates to um, Darren and Jim's presentation, which I have a question about later, which has to do with working collaboratively. So I'm going to show you a selection of projects that inform my work in Overburden um, and then projects, the projects themselves. Uh, I'm compelled to construct what I would call a fictional reworlding of real world phenomena. By reworlding, I mean speculative, speculatively refiguring the world toward more just and intimate relations. So I use the word reworlding here to sort of think about future worlds and possible worlds. Um, and I'm also interested in the vibrational properties of minerals and their invisible forces, both materially and culturally. So the reworlding is kind of, uh, it's based on science, but it's also based on fiction. So in 2014, I was invited to participate in a group show, um, which was called Beside Yourself. Uh, it was an exhibition on emotions. And I chose to manifest the emotion joy, partly because the curator, Marina Roy, mentioned that she couldn't find much artwork that took up joy as its primary sensation. I ended up calling the work A Joyful Wisdom, channeling Nietzsche's book with the same title, which is sometimes referred to as the gay science. Nietzsche wrote, dance, oh, dance on all the ledges, wave crests, cliffs, and mountain ledges, ever finding dances new. Let our knowledges be our gladness. Let our art be sport and madness. All that's joyful shall be true. So I was sort of inspired by um, the title, but also then started to speculate about joyful wisdom and what that might mean. So the exhibition included um, these collages that I made, which were in the foreground of the previous image. Um, and I'll just sort of add here that one of the things that I was doing there, and I think what I try to do in a lot of my work is to have the least amount of components in a work and still have a kind of vibrant composition. So it's kind of a, a, a challenge that I give myself. Um, part of that exhibition was this vitrine. Um, so it was the collages and the vitrines together as the work uh, of a joyful wisdom. And I started to explore joy through a sense of wonder and play with the imagery, with the materials, with the color. Um, 
I kind of think of this as um, a form of channeling where I listen deeply to the images, to their materiality and what they might want to say. So there's a kind of dialogue that I, I feel like I'm working with, with materials, sentient and otherwise. And my hope is that the viewer will experience a, vis a visceral sensation of joy, um, but also wonder um, so that they can sort of find themselves in the work and then maybe um, go a little deeper for themselves. As part of this project, um, I was introduced to the, what I call her is the keeper of the, the minerals. She worked at the Pacific Museum of the Earth at UBC, University of British Columbia. And um, I was shown around the back rooms of the mineral collection. So this was like heaven for me to be able to go and look at all of these strange objects and how they were cataloged and how they were archived. I was allowed to borrow for this exhibition only those rocks that were duplicates in the collection or considered to be of lesser value. So um, I, I thought that was a kind of interesting limit to how I was able to move through there. The best part of this encounter with the mineral collection was the geology professor who bequeathed his collection to the university, which included minerals, um, books, and receipts of um, particular minerals that he bought. It was, uh, it was quite amazing to go back into someone else's, sorry, someone else's um, history with mineral collections. Um, so this began my investment in minerals as geological form and spiritual energy and metaphorical potential. It was a refreshing contrast for me and an evolution from decades of, of teaching, uh, of being an academic educator. So with this work and with most of my work, I'm invested in color and composition and generating a space where the viewer can find their own fascinations and their own informal knowledge practices in the work. And by this, I mean, when, when people would look at this work, they would sort of think about their own mineral collections or they would talk about their own interests. And I think that's really important that, that through their own um, embodied engagement with the work, it opens up a larger conversation about where did these things come from? How did they grow? What is time? Any number of things. Uh, in terms of this configuration, one of the inspirations I found on YouTube, uh, a kind of 10 year old boy who was using minerals to channel um, spirits or energies. So he would create these beautiful configurations. So my inspiration there was this 10 year old who seemed to know more about vibrational energy than, than others. Um, and I like the idea of kind of working both with serious research, but also something more pop cultural and bringing those things together. Um, and then I uh, moved on to another work, which I called Prototype for a Therapeutic Action. Um, and it was a, also an installation of objects, but it also had what I called therapeutic action cards. So what you're looking at is one of the therapeutic action cards and they were takeaway cards. So in addition to uh, a vitrine with crystals were these things that you can take away an image on one side and a text on the other side. So in this case, these were crystals that I that were on my windowsill and the text was bring a talisman with you on a walk where you live pay attention to how this object informs your embodied sense experience. So there's a lot of things happening here, um, but one of the things I'm interested in is how do you take work outside the gallery? How do you uh, ensure that the experience um, is not just something that you look at, but something that you actually embody in some way? So there were five therapeutic action cards and each of them had text behind it and each of them took up different aspects of um, the world around us. So the top were ginkgo biloba leaves, which I harvested from my neighbor's tree. Um, the next image was from Spanish banks, um, where I go for walks sometimes. Um, so it's, it was very much about my own experience, but also encouraging others to have their own experiences, if that makes sense. So this is a description of this project. So prototype for a therapeutic action is an art process that engages with performance, objects, place and time while highlighting an embodied relationship to walking and one's local context. The project is inspired by artist Joseph Boys, whose interest in social sculpture informed this project. Um, and social sculpture um, can be seen on one level as therapeutic, an attempt to heal the wounds of the social body, both external wounds inflicted on others and the internal wounds of collusion and denial which relates to uh, that prompt that uh, Darren gave us earlier. His commitment, Joseph Boys, to objects as symbols and as a means to affect 
his audience reveals a belief that materials have magical power both for the audience and for the artist. So uh, definitely taking inspiration, but also the word I often use is I fictionalize that information. Um, I take it into another realm that is part intuitive and partly kind of um, taking, reworlding, taking things into another context. Um, another aspect of my interest in minerals are a series of salt walks that I've been doing for many years now. I first did one in Vancouver with um, Access Art Gallery. I did it at um, the Nanaimo Art Gallery. And this one here is at 7A11D International Performance Art Festival in Toronto. So this longstanding fascination that I have with minerals began with salt, a mineral composed primarily of sodium chloride. And I've done several of these walks that focus on salt as a historical, a social and a material phenomenon. And this allowed me to develop the research, which I love doing, um, but also to talk to shop, shopkeepers um, and find places where I can bring the group and have a conversation about the mineral. And then to weave together a science fictional approach to this life-giving mineral. So um, each performance is uh, an opportunity to do research on the actual place. And I, and I so in, in Vancouver, the performance was around Chinatown where the gallery was located. And I started exploring the relationship of salt to Chinese history, to Chinese food. Uh, in Nanaimo, I looked at the, um, the pulp and paper mill, which uses um, uh, sodium chloride in the processing of that. And in Toronto, it was a combination of things, but part of it was um, doing research on the actual geology of Toronto and the, the kind of um, the, the, the history of that geology and the amount of sodium chloride that's actually in the earth underneath. But with all of these examples, I take the research and I kind of play with it a little bit and I sort of bring it into different realms. Science fictional is the way I describe it. So in the exhibition, this one is at Oxygen Gallery, I created this um, chart, let's say, and part of it is a kind of rational looking object that categorizes information, but that information is, is this idea of science and fiction. So I ended up creating um, 26 different pieces of writing and found images to accompany them. And, and I created these four categories, which happened to be songs of science, supernatural oracles, natural philosophy, and the underworld. And uh, I, I also produced, I don't know if you can see it here in this image, but I also made an artist book with this as well, in order to take it out of the gallery again and to, to share it with other uh, people in different ways. So I'm gonna read you a little description of this project. Taking the scientific grid as a point of departure, this typology traces the prolix potential of collapsing scientific, industrial, and informal knowledge practices alongside images from the public domain into new mineralogical arrangements. This fictive inventory draws on real data to generate an archeological dig across geographies and histories, and in the process, render visible new architectures of time and matter. Collecting and reassembling these phenomena, scientific truth is brought together with the irrational, the fabricated, and the blithely intuited, wherein mineral infrastructures permeate both the physical and conceptual layers of the project. Working with four distinct and non-hierarchical categories, this data mining is stratified for the purposes of condensation and displacement, elucidation and transformation. Ultimately, these board images and the specific stories they uncover are adapted toward new formations, allowing for an emergent legibility of a world beyond words where matter comes to matter. So it sounds serious, but I'm also playing with the language and I'm also trying to make something that's a little hallucinatory. So you're not quite sure where, where you are in some way. Um, it's not letting me, it's not letting me screen share. My computer is frozen. Can you still hear me? Hmm. Yes, we can. I don't know why it's doing this. Um, Oh, there we go. Okay. Right. So I'll just show you a close up here. Um, uh, so what I did was wrote, wrote these texts as kind of little kind of like essential oils and mousse bouche kind of like concentrations, and then went online and looked for images that were in the public domain that I could use and alter in some way. 
Um, and they're uh, a combination of diagrams and photographs and uh, just trying to really bring things that aren't often together together. Like that uh, image you can see in the, on the right of the uh, um, crystal ball to me is kind of playful in contrast to the more serious images. Um, and the other thing I did was create um, a version of the poster as takeaway posters. And that was a way for the viewer to take this out of the gallery. So these are the, how the posters are installed in the, um, in the exhibition. And I've said this before, but I really love those rocks and I love the way they're sitting on them. Um, so the idea is that you can take this away and you can enjoy it in a different context, which feels really important to me. Um, I'll, I'll read to you uh, one of the um, descriptions which relates to that, that lizard figure there in the poster. Um, chrysophase, usually a translucent light green, is a variety of chalcedony, a form of silica composed of quartz and moganite. Its color comes from the nickel oxide present in its composition. The word ending phrase is a color descriptor signaling its greenish hue, which comes from the Greek for leek. Indeed, it is the color rather than any pattern of mark or markings that has made chirophase so desirable. Deposits of this form of quartz have been found in Russia, Eastern Europe, Brazil, Madagascar, Tanzania, South Africa, Australia, and the US. The Romans first identified it in 23 CE when the stone was believed to strengthen relationships and empower deep understanding. It was considered a magical stone that was recharged at the half moon by exposing it to the night sky. Some cultures believe that the properties of chrysophase allow the bear to become invisible when a fragment is placed in the mouth. In Romanian folklore, it gives the power to access the language of lizards who are believed to represent the soul search for awareness and expansion. And then the third part of uh, my contribution to the exhibition Overburden was um, a sound work, which is called Rock Album. And I originally made a version of this for the Sydney Biennale Nirin in 2020. And then I just uh, shifted it a bit. So the land acknowledgement is the land acknowledgement for the location of the exhibitions rather than Sydney, Australia, the original one. Otherwise it's relatively the same, but it's a way of exploring um, a lot of the things that I'm interested in, uh, in terms of minerals in relationship to extractivism, um, medicine, technology and spirituality. So all of those are sort of woven together in some way. Um, yeah, and then um, just to sort of say thank you again to everybody who's involved with this exhibition and to this panel. And I look forward to the conversation afterwards. Thank you. So do I. <laughs> I so do I, Randy. I think this is gonna be quite an interesting um, conversation and and uh, I'm fascinated at the way you take so many different aspects and so many different practices and and combine them all together um, it really gives us something to um, so many different perspectives to to learn from and look at the um, the art from so um, again please save your questions and we'll look at them at the end of the uh, panel so um, I would now like to introduce Asiniak. Asiniak is the daughter of Carol Rowan and Joby Witalukuk. She is from Inukjuak, Inunuvik, and lives in Teotowaki. Asiniak's uh, work includes filmmaking, writing, curating. She co created Tilranti. <laughs> Asiniak, you're going to have to help me with that one. Um, you have to take your time with all of them and do your best, but take your time and don't okay. let your brain feel confused. Okay. Tilirani, a three-day festival celebrating Inuit artists, art and artists. A cineac wrote and directed 3000 in 2017, a short sci-fi documentary and co-curated Isuma, Isuma's exhibition in the, in the, Canadian Pavilion at the 58th Venice Biennale. Asiniak's work has been exhibited in art galleries and film festivals around the world and was one of 25 winners of the 2020 Sobe Award. 
Oh, uh, here in like I have pleasure to introduce to you Asiniak. Hi. Um, okay, so hello. Oh, I'm not able to share my screen right now. Um, my name is Sinayak, and right now I'm in Jojoge, which is also known as Montreal. I'm from Inuktitut, Nunavik, but I grew up here in Jojoge. Oh, I still can't share my oh. video, so if someone will help me, please. <laughs> um, I love made you host, so just, oh, hang on one second. You made uh, Andrew host. Yes, I'm just seeing I clicked the wrong one. Just one moment, please. Okay, sorry for the delay. <laughs> okay. All right, so here we are. Um, this is my name. I told you who I am. Um, I feel a little bit like I don't talk too much about rocks, though I love them, but I'm gonna introduce you maybe a little bit to my art practice. Um, this is a photo from one of the first um, films that I made that is called Upinahusitik or Lucky, and it's about the beautiful abundance of my homelands. And this is my brother when he was a little baby having a nap on the, on the land. And I just wanted to start by welcoming you to my family and people that I love first. Um, so, um, one of the second artworks that I made is called 3000, which is a short film. And I had the opportunity, um, very luckily to have it included in Insurgents Resurgence at the Winnipeg Art Gallery curated by Jamie Isaac and Julian Eigen. And on the other side of this photo of Lichen, it's my film installation. And then next to them are artworks from my, um, these are artworks from my grandmother and grandfather. So the baskets from my grandmother and the carving is attributed to my grandfather. We're kind of like skeptical that it's him, but we don't think it's anyone else, but we're like not sure it's him. So we're just like adopting it, saying that it's his, but we're still like, we're still thinking about it as a family. <laughs> Um, but it, it felt really special to like have like one of my first like real installations to get to like include include my family in it. Um, yeah, that was awesome. And this is the one of the first times that I got to have um, such a huge installation of a photo, and it really inspired me. I loved it so much. Uh, I love like. Um, when I get to spend time at home with my family, like we always love going outside and spending as much time as we can outside. And so like me and my nieces, my nieces like steal my camera and run around and, you know, we just have lots of fun um, together. Here, uh, this is one of the first exhibitions that I curated. Um, because I also work as a curator as well as an artist in many, I just like work in as many ways that I can, <laughs> however the story needs to get told. Um, this is one of the first exhibitions I curated, um, which was a collection of dolls that my late great aunt Elizabeth Inukuk made, and, and they needed a background, so I very willingly got some of my photos installed again. <laughs> And it was really fun to do so and to have like summer and winter, um, because you can see here, there's like um, kind of more winter clothes and so on. Um, because of what the dolls look like. Um, this collection of dolls is extra special to me because um, my mom works in early childhood education and she worked with my aunt. And so my aunt went around our communities, there's 14 of them. And she talked with other elders 
and the collected stories. And then um, she thought that for children to really like hear a story and understand it, it's better to have something they can play with. So all of uh, some of the stories she collected, they have these dolls that go with them. But why it was really important to have an exhibition with them is because after they were made for kids, the funders like stole them back and didn't let the kids play with them. So whenever we can, we want to like let them be outside and let them have people bring life to them because they were really made to be played with by children. And what was amazing here was this is at Fofa Gallery at Concordia. And when I was like just hanging out outside of the V-Train, I would like watch kids like pull their parents, like when they were trying to go to the Metro, pull their parents so that they could like keep looking at the, at the installation. Cause the other thing is that it's like at kid eye level, a lot of it. Um, this is illustration work in Auckland in Tamaki Makoto. And this is um, artwork that's about like, uh, I, I really like working with like concepts and trying to communicate like feelings. So these ones are feelings of being ashamed and then being um, like sure of yourself. Um, then one of like the bodies of work that I'm working on are scores that are inspired by fluxism. When I like learned about fluxism at art school, it completely like, I just feel like I like brought it into myself. I was like, this is me, this is what I do. <laughs> um, I love it so much. If you don't know too much about fluxism, it's a movement of art that was um, started around the late 60s, 70s. And um, one of the prolific artists for me is Yoko Ono in that kind of mode. And some of the books that she made, Grapefruit and Acorn are really like, just are full of like fluxus spores. And what I love about it is that it's like, you can take any moment in life and when you kind of like give yourself to it, you make everything art and everything meaningful just by your sheer energy <laughs> giving it to it. And um, so I love that. So I like working with scores and this is one of the only collaborative scores that I made. It's called Intimacy Piece. I made it with my friend Dana Danger. Um, and it's, we made this specifically to be online and we made it all completely naked. So we <laughs> had to be really, I don't know, careful for ourselves, right? To feel safe and everything, but it was so much fun to make. And um, it was really interesting to make this work intimacy piece specifically to always live online and how we were thinking about how you connect to people online. And then like, what, like a year and a half later, COVID. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the piece like really started to mean something to us. Um, but it's like very tricky to try to like distill an idea down into like one action and have it communicate in an action. And I have definitely failed at it. I made an attempt for one about boundaries where I like put up a wall of stones and then had my friend like dump water. And so we could see how much water would get through and how much would be stopped as kind of a metaphor for it. And all of the water just like seeped into the ground. And so it was so not dramatic or anything. So it really does take um, trying and time and effort to get it right. Um, this is at the Triennial in, in Melbourne. Uh, other fun things I get to do. Sometimes people ask me to take photos and here, um, I was at home in Inukjurak with my cousin's wife, Karen, and she wanted to try seeing if we could take wild berries and make like a berry patch with them. So this is one of our favorites called Ekpiks. 
And so we went around looking for, um, for the plants, for the, you know, female and male ones. And um, we made a patch and I actually didn't get to ask yet if it worked, but it was very fun and also very weird because I love gardening and I garden here all the time, but like in Inukturak, the land doesn't get, um, the land doesn't get maneuvered in that way. So when we're trying to find a route and we try to get as long as a route as we can, we're like peeling back this earth that has never maybe been touched that way at all. And um, it was like a very, 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 there was like such strong feelings doing it. Like kind of, should we be doing this? And um, but also to think of how old those plants are. Some of them are very old. Then we had to wash them. Oh, but that was a very fun thing to do. This is an installation of a orc called Where You Go I Follow, about water. And this is um, from the first time that I ever tried eating sea urchins. And those are the ones that I ate right there. <laughs> Um, and because of this exhibition is called The Wildflower and it was all about kind of like flora and I was thinking, I love flora, but also we have to talk about water if we talk about it and you have to talk about water if you talk about almost anything, probably everything. <laughs> And then finally, this is the piece that's in this um, show. Oh wait, no, not this one. This is one that I just made this summer. Um, and I made it in my partner's homelands um, in, in New Zealand. And it's about resisting and submitting. And it's about also like sometimes resisting, um, so like sometimes resisting is good for you and sometimes resisting is bad for you. Sometimes submitting is good for you. Sometimes it's bad for you. So it's like you go, it's just like the, the work just goes in this cycle. And like, you know, I go through the cycle in my brain too, of like, you know, how far you, when you think about something long enough, it kind of like turns back to the other end. So I find this work, it's that. And I also always think about cycles. I think a lot, and especially with the scores, it's a lot about cycles because we're just like always repeating and going back and relearning. Um, so this, this is, we'll see if, In the, this is the work that's in this exhibition. And um, this work originally was made on accident or what, in the spur of the moment with my friend and her father and brother who were visiting while we were in university. We went for a walk together and there was still a little bit of snow and we decided to go off trail to find, to follow up uh, a path of droplets of blood that maybe some animal got bit on the leg or something and we went following it and then we ended up at the shore where there was tons of rocks and then we just like started covering her in stones I think we didn't even talk about it we just did it and um, then after she did it she was like oh my gosh you have to try it so I think we all took a turn being covered in stones. And then through that experience, I kept thinking about it. And um, I was making a, a film, one of my final films. And um, it, I got so many more of my friends to try it. And I just kept thinking about it. And as I thought about it, 
uh, it grew and grew and grew what it meant. And then I got an opportunity to make another score. And when I was again in New Zealand and I had a limited of time, so I just said, I'm gonna do this. And um, after I did it, I realized and I learned through it, like at the beginning of the world, we found babies in the ground. And so you would like walk around if you wanted a baby, if you wanted an amazing baby, you had to walk really, really, really far. And then you would take them out of the ground. And so the, um, the coming out is kind of like the being born. And then um, when you die, you get, depending on the time of year, you get covered in stones. And so then you're going back into it. And so there's, I mean, there's a million ways that I think of this um, score, but that's one of the ways I think about it a lot. And also that cycle. Um, so um, you can see it on the website if you wanna see rock piece. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Asiniak, that was beautiful. And um, there's just such a, a, a loveliness to your presence and um, a good reminder for me to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, take my time. And I re re really appreciate that. Um, the, I was struck by your work and the one photo um, of you taking the earth um, apart to um, plant the, you know, and looking at the plant roots and thinking about, uh, it reminded me of two things. It reminded me of uh, Tara's work that she looked at this morning where they're just digging up the um, permafrost so drastically in Russia. And, uh, and it also made me think of um, just the whole term of overbird of how the mining industry considers the topsoil as this problem <laughs> rather than uh, this thing this thing that we have to nurture and take care of and 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 appreciate um, so thank you for that um, again if you have questions for Asiniak we'll we'll take them at the end um, I'd like to introduce at this time Keith Keith Lang Langergraber received his BFA from the University of Victoria and his MFA from the University of British Columbia. He has work, shown his work extensively in solo and group exhibitions and galleries in Canada, the US and Asia since 1995. Most recently at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery, Burrard Art Foundation and the Burnaby Art Gallery. He has received many grants and awards for his work, including a Sobe Award nomination, and has given numerous lectures and presentations on his artistic research. In 2005, he was selected to represent Art Emily Carr at the Canadian Art College's Collaborative Banff Residency, Media and Visual Arts, Banff, Alberta. Langergraber researches specific sites to explore social, cultural, and political change. His research and art allows an understanding of the shifts that have taken place at that location over time. Keith Langergraber is a lecturer at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Keith thanks the BC Arts Council for their generous support. And please welcome Keith Langergraber. Hi everyone, I'm Keith Langergraver. I'm uh, speaking from the traditional unceded territories of the Salish, Salic Okanagan. And um, I'm very generous to be a guest and to be grateful for the land and the space and just being able to be with you all here today. And uh, I wanna put my gratitude out to everyone's energies and particularly those that uh, put it into making this amazing exhibition possible. Give me one second here.
So I'm going to start back with my MFA work, which took me on a sort of circle that uh, led me to being with you all here today. Um, this piece was called Partially Buried. And I excavated a mining uh, shack, a shed in the Redelac area. And that's um, on the pass between New Denver and Caslow. And um, I, I grew up, or I didn't grow up in the Kootenays. I was born in the Kootenays, spent some time in my youth there. But I've always returned rock hunting, looking for old ghost towns came upon a structure that was hit um, by an avalanche of debris. It was falling over and um, I, I was interested in muse museological recreations at that time and entropy and site specificity was very much becoming a part of my installation based practice. So um, I took my truck and uh, you know brought ore samples, debris, junk, um, and brought that to UBC uh, studios where before the um, piece went up at the Belkin Gallery. And um, at that time, I was enamored with Smithson's idea of the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy. Um, but I wanted to be a bit cheeky with this idea. So I created this stilled um, entropy in the gallery space so that the viewer could go into this shack or shed. Uh, you know, I'm doing a little bit, bit of a play on Smithson's very famous piece, the partially buried woodshed. But unlike Smithson's shed um, or shack or whatever you know it was at Kent State University, um, I basically created this avalanche of material, um, and there's enough pounds per square inch that the shed or the shack should go over the handlebars and collapse. So when the viewer went into the space, it, there was a sense of precarity and like, oh, wait a second, is this safe? Um, and beneath the um, avalanche of detrius and geological strata and industrial waste that's hitting this material, there's um, cables running to the gallery wall where there's a plate that's holding this shack in this state where it's not collapsing. So it's um, uh, this play on the material based ruin in reverse. Um, every bit of junk that, not every bit, but all the small pieces I ended up doing drawings of and covered this big 18 foot wall um, with this taxonomy of minerals, uh, core samples, um, industrial debris, um, some from the Kootenai, some from an abandoned cement factory called Bamberton that I was researching and making work on. Um, but it was mainly all about this site in Redelac um, that I don't know, fascinated me for hiking reasons. Um, I always found good, good, good rock hunting in that area, lots of ruins around that area. So I, I've always been coming back to that site in the Kootenays. Uh, I was born in Trail BC and, and the new work that um, I've been doing has been sort of this psychogeographic sculptural map of these ruined explorations and um, you know, the first few years of my life, we lived in Rosalind and, you know, I, I, I'm remembering the, those two smokestacks from memory and, and a little bit of a play on the German factory that Kaminko um, was designed upon. But of course, the idea was if we make it twice as big, it'll be, you know, and we, we all heard the stories, you know, from Patty, how, um, you know, the, the damage that this did to the land. And I know certain days at school, you couldn't go outside, uh, like, you know, things have gotten better, but um, so I couldn't do this piece about the Kootenays without um, reflecting on like my birth site and, um, and memories of hiking in Roslyn to mines and, and such. But um, I actually started getting really interested in 
the basis to these sculptures when I was thinking about overburden. Like, yes, there's a lot of detail in these kit bash models, the 3D printing, the crystals that I often found on site, or, you know, sometimes at a garage sale in Grand Forks, I got lucky there and, and got some. So I'm not particularly obsessed about authenticity. I'm interested in artifice and um, uh, ruptures in my aesthetic that are hopefully changing. So that's a detail shot of sort of my ode to, to trail and um, ghost towns, ruins around that area. Uh, this is the piece up at the Oxygen Art Gallery right now. And the central piece is the mining concentrator at Redelac. So along with finding um, that abandoned shed that was hit by this wave of material, I came on this huge hulking um, mine concentrator and, and um, it's very close to the uh, Sandin, um, the town, ghost town of Sandin or space of Sandin. And um, I just wanted to play with geological time and scale so that it wasn't realistic that this mining concentrator is completely out of scale with one of the recreations of a saloon that would be up on the mountain town. Again, there's, um, I'm going back to those early interests in Smithson around the non-site in that, that stubby piece of wood that the power pole or the telegraph pole is on, that was actually pulled on site from uh, a downed pole. Um, and, and the little nub on the model would be the size. So that I'm throwing scale out of proportion in regards to like, geological um, are, are insignificance in, in relationship to these geological powers at play. And, and, and this is, I guess with this piece too, is where I start, yeah, like that model took a very long time to make like meticulous work, but I, I really wanted to put time into the bases of sculptures um, so that I used these hulking pieces of wood, made, my, made life difficult for myself with the shipping, the gallery preparators at, at the oxygen gallery, like the shelf had to be quite sturdy to hold this up. But um, the Kootenai Lake, the dam system there, um, uh, it buried a lot of forest. And there was a lot of underwater logging done. So I didn't want to just talk about the, this extraction that was done on the surface. Is um, visually, I wanted to, to show like that there were so many levels of ingenuity that leads to a lot of um, ecological problems at the time. Like, you know, a, a lot of strip mining was done in the Kootenays, but then the dams opened up. Um, whole other avenues. And, and for me, these pieces are sort of um, temporal markers of what's to come, you know, like we're just seeing the beginning of this cascading wave of uh, like a hyper object such as global of global warming, and it's just going to expand. So I, I wanted all these structures not to feel stable in their space that sometimes they're sinking. Uh, you know, like that early uh, research that I was doing on the abandoned cement factory in Victoria, maybe that carried over and I had this haunting image of visiting the site and it honestly felt like people just left the cement machines running and it just poured over the whole landscape. But it was really just this calcium dust was in the air, it landed, the rain hardened it. And, um, you know, like, I, I am guilty of being a bit of a romantic, like I, I'm, I do love ruins, but I, um, hopefully I can be self-reflexive in that there's layers to them. There's, um, ruins aren't just uh, physical things. They can also be, um, they can affect psychogeographic space. Like the land holds a memory of, of the trauma. And, so these drawings are kind of new and, and the sculptures. What was really fun about this show is um, 
I you, usually I work really ponderously, and I did with the, the that model of the um, concentrator. But I honestly finished all the sculpture pieces like a, a couple days before they had to be shipped, and that was actually a rewarding process. To like, you know, it wasn't like I was putting it off, but I I just wanted to work in a more immediate way with this work and thinking about overburden. So these sketches were very loose you know these went over a period of time but usually the more successful ones happened in five minutes versus half an hour so i was embracing gesture um coming back to these structures and re representing them more like uh, wave patterns and um i really appreciated uh, uh the the drawings of the mountains with the trilobites and i'm seeing the the, the sort of forms here in, in that sort of gestural sensibility. Um, yeah, they're, they're very loose because I'm going to go back to like, you know, some of my drawings are six feet by eight feet. And this is a work I did for the Burnaby Art Gallery, um, you know, where it takes a couple months to do. And um, I'm going to I'm going to come back to the work at Nelson and sort of jump into an in, in, in between phase. Like so the most recent exhibit I did, which really took on ge geology, and my interests in hunting down ghost towns was at the Burnaby Art Gallery, the piece called um, Betrayal at Babylon. And there was a film that went along with this, uh, uh, followed a group of prospectors looking for tektite meteorites. Those are glass meteorites. So when a meteorite hits the earth, there's an impact and the fragments coming down will be um, molten glass and these beautiful glass meteorites and they're quite valuable. But I, I was looking also at um, language and how we really don't have the capacity to acknowledge the complexity and burden and um, inexorable uh, finality of global warming with language. So I was trying to like, how, how can um, I account for that slippage. And I, I started thinking about Bruegel's um, Tower of Babel and, and that became a, a starting point for me. So I remapped uh, his recreation, which I really liked because it, it appeared to be more in construction rather than a finished Tower of Babel. Like uh, this idea of a ruin in reverse, it was kind of being built up and being uh, Sm smote from God at the same time, like it was I'm ready down. to cut this off. <clears throat> um, so there's, uh, you know, it's things that make it look like it's building up. Uh, there's r ghost towns that you'd see in BC, Bamberton, um, uh, the copper mine on the way to Whistler, art historical things mashed together. And um, the, the you know, this is a different way I presented it. Um, it. It was an installation where the city of Babylon was created on the gallery floor and there was this figure ground relationship happening between the drawings and the sculptures. And I kind of liked with this that the viewer, you know, had to get down low on the ground and it set up this um, strange sort of scale and temporality. But um, what was fun kind of with the work at the Oxygen art gallery is I got to present these works as sculptures and, and thinking about, well, the sculpture has um, a, a different sort of temporality, a different sense of movement, um, a, a different sort of formality. And there was lots of lucky, lucky accidents that happened. Like uh, when I made the drawing for these shelves, they were two by fours painted white, you know, just to be strong enough to hold up the weight of these boards. And the drawings got hung up on these wall on a wall that it wasn't a nice clean gallery wall. It had these slats, and um, so the, those relationships started happening site specifically. So even though I wasn't there for the install, it, it I'm happy that um, it turned out very site specific in its own way because this this piece had a lower elevation. Um, uh, than the other shelf. And um, I think they all work really nice with, um, particularly with Randy's work, it's a real pleasure to have that dialectic um, going on. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, talking about my materials, it's like, 
I'm making ecological art, but lots of stuff I'm using is like really bad for the environment. I'm using spray foam, um, you know, I'm using paint and I always like, you know, with some exhibits, I'm like, you know, when I did in Portland, Oregon, it was all like shirts I got from a thrift store and shoes and I made this huge cascading wave and I gave all those t-shirts away at the uh, Leaside or the Burnside skateboard park and I gave all the shoes and but some work it's like I want to confront the horror of like these industrial productions and you know sometimes I'm getting my hands dirty which is also like not good for myself like um, but it's uh something about how um i've grown up you know like growing you know having these experiences at a very very early age with these um environment or these factory monoliths is like you know there, there's some of that in the work and um the tension between these natural and um very unnatural materials that we work with as artists yeah, I, I think I'm good. We've we've been here for a long day, and I, I think it'd be better if we had more time for questions. Uh, thank you all for listening and being here with me. Thank you, Keith, and uh, thank you, everybody who's been presenting this afternoon. It has been a long day, but it's been so interesting and so um, insightful. So um, I just have a, a question. I'm going to modify it slightly to, to uh, I'd sent them out to the artists beforehand, and um, but I'm going to modify it um, a little bit, just given what we've heard this afternoon. So, um, so the question was originally, the subtitle of this discussion is Speculative and Embodied Ways of Relating to Rock, Mineral and Mountain. So the original question was, how would you describe your relationship with the subject of your work and how is this expressed? But I'm also sensing a lot of theme around relationships between people too. So um, that kept coming up for me today in, in the presentations. So um, maybe we could talk about how your work reflects relationships between people as well as relationships with the subject, subjects of your work. So um, does anybody want to start or shall I uh, pick on <laughs> pick on somebody? Darren and Jim, do you want to start? Darren, do you want to break the ice or, or shall I uh, try? You break the ice, Jim. <clears throat> OK. Um, well, uh, yeah, Maggie, I've, I've been contemplating these questions for a while and I still don't have a completely formed uh, idea about it, but I've been thinking a lot about the, the mountains and making artwork, both depicting the mountains and artwork while walking around in the mountains. And why is it that I'm so drawn to these places? Um, I, I, I was thinking a little bit actually about um, what Randy was saying earlier about the emotion of, of joy uh, and I think that that actually is part of it for me, that I grew up uh, snowboarding and I loved that uh, sense of immersion and oblivion in some ways when I'm out in the mountains covered in snow and feel like I've disappeared into this giant being that's older and far larger than I am. It's a little bit like swimming in the ocean. I, I feel minuscule in this sort of reassuring way that uh, is rela relaxes me. Um, and so does drawing, actually. I think drawing helps me a lot with keeping down anxiety, even if I'm feeling stressed or uh, sad. While I'm drawing, I feel more peaceful. Um, and so I think I, I go to these places for a feeling of relief, actually. Um, and I, I, speaking of the sense of oblivion, that's not always the case, especially when you're with other people. I noticed that my experience wandering around in the mountains and forests is far different when I'm with somebody and with a friend who I'm chatting with than when I'm by myself. When I'm alone, I'm looking at the world, I'm listening to the sounds. Uh, and it's hard to do that at the same time while I'm in my head. And sometimes it takes days of walking before you get there. Um, after five days, a five day long trek, I um, am able to sort of 
I feel that I'm actually lost in that place differently. Uh, so with Darren, it's a very social experience. I'm sure we scare away half the animals who are chatting as we go along. Um, uh, and, and Andrew, who's in the crowd too, the whole time we're, we're thinking um, and sometimes taking notes, but it's not really work. It's just being with each other. And, and uh, uh, I, I, th I was thinking of, uh, earlier, Rebecca Solnit was brought up, this idea of the, the mind at three miles an hour. If I'm sitting here across a, a table from you, I'll probably say and think different things than if we're going for a walk. Uh, I find that there's a sort of clarity that happens when I'm in motion. That, so the sensations of, of motion and or transportation and transformation uh, that happen when you're in motion, you watch the world change around you. And over time, the weather changes, it gets, it turns into nighttime, it starts raining um, and, and seeing how, you know, you turn a corner and, and the world is suddenly a different place. Um, it's something I really love. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll pass it on to someone else now. Darren, did you want to say a few words? Uh, I'll uh, just because Jim and I are two in a group. If there's time, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll reflect on the end. But I, I'd, I'd love to hear everyone's perspectives. Make sure everyone has a chance um, in relation to their art practices. So I'll defer sure. to the end if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Randy, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, um, one of the things I really am enjoying more and more with my practice is collaboration. So it's really nice to see the collaboration between Jim and, and Darren. Um, but I also, I think with everybody who's spoken today, there's a collaboration with family, there's a collaboration with site. And I think that what it suggests, and I think the only way we're going to get out of the problems that we're in is not thinking individually, but thinking relationally. Right, so it's that relation that makes us human, and it's that relation that brings joy, and it brings love. It takes time, and I think also, you know, relating to what Jim was saying about being, you know, all those years of being in the woods or being in the mountains. There's a sense of, you know, what I get out of the the work that I've done with minerals is a sense of duration, and it is a durational work in that it's not a work that's finished. I feel like I'm always returning to it in some way, the project. So there's a quality of time and duration that is manifest. And I would say it manifests love and joy in that um, it's not like a boundlessness. I mean, we have egos and we have boundaries in our body, but I feel like the thing that most fulfills me in making work and sharing work is that sense of being connected to others, um, human and otherwise, uh, that's the thing that I can't, it's, all, it's also the thing that in terms of um, the pandemic and lockdown, that's the thing that's kept me going as well, is even though I spend a lot of time alone right now, it's, it's like even things like this, that you feel connected, that you feel like you're actually part of something bigger, and then the mountains and the rocks and all of that just, uh, just makes that so much more powerful. Absolutely. I was thinking simil along similar lines about, about the relationships and collaboration and yeah. Um, Keith, would you like to, oh, oh sorry, <laughs> Keith or Esenia, do you have, would you like to jump in? Esenia? You there? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I wanted to say that I agree that thinking in motion is different than when you're still. And a lot of the times, actually, when I have like a problem that I'm trying to solve, I just like leave it in the back of my head. And then one day I'll be like walking or waiting for a bus or something. And I'll be like, bam, there it is. <laughs> I, had to go, I had to go walking to find it. The piece of the puzzle. Uh, and when it comes to this work rock piece and how I relate to it and its subject, I think like one of the important things about the process about like covering your body in rocks is that the rocks in your body have like tons of energy. And one of the amazing things about that experience is about like feeling that energy and also being inside of the rocks or being inside of anything like 
at least for me, it reminds me that I'm not like separate from all these things. So I feel like the way that I relate to the, to, to like the rocks in that piece, for example, is that like I, at least in that moment, when I'm doing the performance, I don't feel separate from them. I don't think of myself as separate from them. We get to like be doing all together. And I think that's important. Thank you, Pusiniak. Um, uh, Keith? Yeah, no, I, I was thinking back to that MFA show I did and so like, you know, that was almost 20 years ago and like doing environmental art, like at UBC, very conceptual school. It wasn't like in vogue at that period. And um, like, I, I know with early work, I would always like find a way to like bring these interests that I've always had to like, oh, I got to justify this getting it into the gallery. So I'll make this art historical reference to like something like Smithson's par partially buried woodshed. And what I found refreshing about this show is like, no, this is like, I get to do this, you know, my way. And like, I, I'm just gonna focus on these amazing places in the Kootenays, these interesting structures that pose these questions. And I, I think it's, it's kind of really cool that, um, work like this is being recognized and I just am like it was sort of breath of relief like I did you know I could be art historical and referential but I don't need to anymore I think we all get it that there's these big problems and um you know it's the artists that hopefully can ask the hard questions and and do it in ways that aren't didactic because that's not working it's got to be more through love, reciprocity, um, digging, hard work, you know, to, to make some sort of change. So I guess I got to be a little less institutional, which is refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree, um, Keith, in, in that um, really like our way forward is about, about us um, collaborating and, and creating from what is real, not what is in our heads and or what what is, um, we have to think of new ways of doing and being and talking and working. So um, I think I have another question here, but I think what I'm gonna do is turn it over to um, the audience, the viewers. And um, instead of being an audience or viewers, you can be participants and ask questions. And um, oh, thank you so much, Jim, Darren, Randy, Asiniak, and Keith. Um, if there is, uh, or if there's no qu questions from the audience, I can go back to a question I had. But I think um, I will turn it over to Natasha to moderate questions from from the participants. Okay, great. Um, Asinayak has her hand up, so just one moment, let me go. I just wanted to help Darren get attention. Oh, tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Asinayak. <laughs> um, I didn't so, know. Um, if you have questions for any of our presenters today, you can type them in the chat. Um, and I'll happily read them out, or I can spotlight you and you can ask your question. So just let let me know if you'd like to ask a question. Am I able to add just a short reflection to that last question? Absolutely, Darren. Sure. Um, I think, Bill, I, I love everything that everyone said. When I think of a question like that, um, I, I always think about how I think all of our relationships to land uh, are relationships to people, fundamentally. Uh, because, because our relationship to land is defined by political boundaries, it's defined by class, it's defined by history, it's defined by family. So um, I, I don't think it, it, in, there's all, we have our person, like me, myself, I have a personal experience in nature. I, I will enjoy this particular hike or have these particular thoughts. But everything about that process and the access to that particular nature is also profoundly shaped 
by political ecology, right? And by political relationships. And so that's something I'm always cognizant of is this, um, this idea that, that nature is socially produced in the context in which we understand it. So uh, I really appreciate how a lot of artists today are talking about relationship, uh, even if they're alone um, in, in, in natural spaces, for lack of a better word. I have a question. <laughs> um, so it kind of goes back to the idea of reworlding and thinking about so many of the way the tactics in which the, all many of you are are doing that. Like I heard joy and saw humor and science fiction and speculation, rewilding, resisting, submitting, um, working through artifice. So to me, it feels like all of these connect to reworlding and in a way um, bring forth an alternative to what Darren called the petrofamiliar, which I hadn't heard before, but I like that term. And I kind of thought about it as the insipidive of, insipidness of the normative ways we're caught in, in capitalism right now. And so I guess my question is, um, how do you guys, it's a question that I have as an artist too, but how do you see your role right now as the world is so kind of crumbling around us? How do you see it in a political sphere or how do you see those, those reworlding acts as political acts? That's probably a big question. I think that I always see my role as um, like, doing what I can to inspire people who see my work with thought, whatever that would be. So I just, I think I see my work as like a portal or like a poke, hopefully to, to invite some reflection. And that applies before COVID and after and during. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll jump in here. Um, that's a question I ask myself all the time, Jen, in terms of, you know, what's the role? What's the role of our, what's the role of the individual given the kind of challenges we have and what's the role of the artist? And I think, you know, depending on the project, obviously, but I think the role of the artist is to, uh, to poke, to provoke, to prod, um, you know, to make us feel a little uncomfortable it, and that could look like a lot of different things. So I, I think that, you know, when, when um, um, Jim and Darren were talking about the disregard as a symptom, um, you know, I, and, and we talked about it in the earlier panel, you talked about mourning and I brought up grief. And I think that our job is to be real with what we're experiencing. Um, and also as artists, sometimes we don't even know what we're experiencing, but we're expressing it. And only once the work is made, do we then have time to look at it and maybe understand what it is, but maybe it's not for us to understand, it's for the viewer, the audience to continue the conversation with the work by responding to it in some way. So I think part of it is not censoring yourself and also the, the other side of that is, and I felt this, you know, the last year so much with my own practice and my own life is they can't, your work can't do everything. Um, so you, you can't, it's, so it's really important that you don't beat yourself up. Like, why aren't I doing enough? But I feel like by doing something, by expressing emotions, difficult emotions, um, ugly emotions, um, minor feelings, as Kathy Park talks about, I'm thinking a lot about unsettled feelings. That's, I think, one way that we can start to navigate this thing that you're describing. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, I just wanted to add the joy that you spoke about. I think that's part of it too. And the connection that you have all as artists to your materials that again, offers something to, to your viewers like Essiniak was saying. So thank you. We do have one question and it is from Gabby. 
And Gabby says, uh, how do you involve your public with your art practice? Jim, do you wanna start that first? <laughs> hmm. um, hey Gabby, <laughs> I, th I think it really, it really depends on the project. Um, sometimes my work is actually viewer participation. Like I'll um, wrap a room in paper and invite everybody who walks in to draw on the walls with me for a month and the space will get more and more dense with space, uh, with um, drawn space that is. But other times I, 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 I flicker back and forth between this sort of uh, uh, participatory and collaborative work and more reclusive solitary work. Like most authors w don't collaborate, work in silence and people participate when they turn the pages and read the book. So, um, and you know, a lot of my work, I, I don't even relook at it myself, like filling tons of sketchbooks and um, uh, diaries with things that I, I, have, I don't even know what's in there anymore. So it's a full spectrum from um, including people and feeling that I actually need to do this by myself to, to, to learn something. Um, I guess with this work right now, it, the collaboration with Darren is a big thing because um, Darren thinks differently than I do. Uh, he has completely sometimes different thoughts than I do. Um, though, I mean, a collaboration like ours is pretty harmonious. We're like uh, musicians who know how to play the same songs, but play different instruments. Uh, it would be different with others where we would be just making cacophonous noise. Darren and I have had practice. Um, but I mean, in the end right now, it's, it's looking at the works in the, uh, online on the, on the website and in uh, Kootenai Gallery, if people get to, to visit in real life. Um, and then hopefully someday it will be a publication. So I've been posting them a lot on Instagram, which at the moment seems like the easiest way to share my work with other people. Um, so I, I think I'm kind of looking for every chance and opportunity and avenue that there is. And, and at this point, just trying to see what happens. I, I don't, it's all brand new work. I've never made comics before. So I'm kind of watching what, what occurs and what people think. Uh, it's interesting when people aren't quite sure if it's really dark or if it's funny. And I, that basically makes me happy because it's both. And I like that it's a little bit ambiguous. Great, thanks. Um, maybe we can see how Darren would answer that question differently. <laughs> It was Gabby's question. Um, right. How do you involve public in your art practice? Um, so I, I used to be a journalist and I guess some people say you're never not a journalist. So I guess I'm just kind of in, in hibernation. So um, I actually have a lot of anxiety about public work and it's probably one of the reasons I don't do journalism anymore because every single time I wrote a story, I actually couldn't help but, you know, um, my politics would always bleed through and I always lived in fear of the blowback. And sometimes the blowback was very real. Um, and and if, if, if you can't handle anxiety that well, it's a difficult, it's a difficult job to, to sustain throughout your life. Um, but, but I really, um, in terms of, I've always been really, you know, like, um, I got really interested in, in, in like things like culture jamming and, um, and social practice art and stuff like that. And I've always, kind of love the idea of pranks and things like that. Although some, sometimes I think it's a little unfair because um, when you're doing that type of artwork, you're presuming things about your audience that you may or may not know. Um, and it, it's, it's a reflection on yourself and your own worldview, not just the worldview of others. Um, but I think, uh, you know, in, in kind of the, the bigger scale, the question, this idea, can art um, move the world in particular directions that are more just, that are more equitable, that are more ecologically sensible, um, uh, harmonious. Um, I think art has an important role to play in that. And I really like what, what, what Randy and Esseniak were saying, this idea of poking, you know, and also that idea that Randy was talking about of not having to do it all because there is a lot of pressure um, to kind of have all the nuance in one particular square, right? That was one of the difficult parts about the comic was trying to have all these, you know, I just finished you know, seven years of research and, you know, you have six, you have a panel and, and you have to really begin to say, what is the particular story that I can tell in this particular frame? And hopefully that resonates with someone in a way. And that idea goes somewhere else. I think that's kind of the hope and the belief and kind of the thing that at least myself in any type of communication I do is, is what I grounded in is that belief that 
um, that these ideas can move in society in particular ways that are helpful. Would uh, Randy or um, Sinayak or Keith want to jump in? Sure, I can. Um, I guess what I, I would echo what people have already said, but what I would add from where I'm at now is that I've been um, teaching for almost 30 years and I've been an academic, I've written academic writing and I've taught students to kind of lift up their critical thinking. Um, and it, that became a kind of muscle that I knew how to do. And sometimes the way I spoke and the way I thought was not accessible to a more general audience. So in terms of that question that Gabby has, which is a great, great question, um, is I've, I've really tried to make my work complex while still being simple. And so one of the things I, I try to do in the work is I try to make it for everyone and anyone, but not dumb it down. So I don't know if that comes through in the, the emotion that you bring to it or the intensity. Um, I think you can say complex things in very uh, um, uh, more um, straightforward ways. But I think that's one way in terms of the public, which is the word that Gabby used, um, is, is I think that's the way you can get it out there without um, going over someone's head or intimidating them is just making it accessible. And at the same time, communicating your love and joy for the subject. And I think that that also will be infectious. I think that, well, that's actually a weird word to use right now. Um, it will be, um, you know, it will, it, will, it will produce an affect in, in the person, in, in their body, in their energy, in their emotions. So I feel like that's what I would add to this conversation about um, making something more public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in now, just because I've been in all these different modes of working, like I've uh, been doing this like group show, um, a solo show up in Prince George. Um, but right now I'm working on a big public art piece for the VAG and it's it's so different because like with COVID I've sort of had to assemble like a team around me to get enough of the work done. So, um, you know, getting my dad on board to help with construction and like we're all building and and then like every bit of work you do has to be approved by a structural engineer. And then it's like back to the drawing board and Zoom talks and and it's been good, to, you know, like, and I feel very fortunate, but it's it's been an interesting time to be making work. And it's been, made me really be reflective of my own privilege to be able to be making work and sharing work and being um, a voice out there. And I, it, it, it um, you know, it's not something that freezes me. Like I, I'm been around the block. I, I can work, I can work under pressure, but it, it makes me like not take for granted the opportunity of being an artist to be with, um, you know, wonderful people like yourself. And uh, hopefully that translates when I get this stage, like I'm starting to think of it more as theater. Like I'm creating this, um, you know, a set in downtown Vancouver that's based on these two fire towers that sit on this interstitial space in the Manning Park region where they're, they're right on the edge of the Canadian US border. There's a fire tower on the Canadian side and the American side. And I'm, I'm using these fire towers almost as these barometers for climate change because there's this huge forest fire that, you know, fire doesn't acknowledge borders. and um, so it's it's going to be interesting, like um, how how the work plays out, and how the audience responds to a work, particularly when um, we don't know the like way things are going to play out in relationship to COVID and how things open up, and you know you know I think when we all come out in the fall. Um, we're going to be interacting in a different way. And I, I think it's going to be taking a while till we normalize. I don't, you know, a lot of things, I don't want things to normalize in their own way too, because I think we've figured out a lot of things around racism and uh, 
you know, uh, our relationships to the first people of this land. And, um, you know, COVID has given us space to look hard at ourselves and that we have a lot of room to grow. And, you know, those are all thoughts coming my way when um, I'm working towards this big piece. Um, I think for me on that question about um, public, some of my artwork, I think I make like really like from for myself and like from my feelings. So that's like really just me. But some of my work is really for my community. And um, like when I was making 3000, it ends in the future. And um, I don't think it's okay for me to just imagine the future alone. So I like talk to my family and my cousins and I talk to my community about what they would want it to look like. And then like use our wishes together to create what that looks like. So I think sometimes, sometimes um, community like working together and sharing knowledge is really important. And then um, on the other hand, when I'm doing curation, when it's in my power to do so, I always like to make the art gallery feel inviting. Sometimes it feels scary for people, especially people who don't go to see art a lot. And I just want the most amount of people to feel welcome. So like one thing that we often do is like have tea that can be served and like you know, just do something to make it feel like you could sit a little bit or hang out a little bit in the gallery. And then on that too, sometimes the situation makes it possible to have like a wall or a vitrine or something that can be kind of a part of the gallery space where um, in one of, one of the exhibitions I did with, for Isuma, it was with a lot of their Polaroids. So people who visited the gallery could take a Polaroid and like there was like a special like kind of like visitor wall. So then people can kind of become a part of the exhibition. And that was at a university at hum Humber. And um, I heard that like tons of students would come back after their class would visit to come and show their friends. And so like, you know, when you allow people and make space for people to have some of themselves in the gallery, like that exhibition becomes theirs as well. And I think um, it's really powerful to be able to share art that way and make people feel like it's theirs. Thank you, Asiniak. I think um, this feels like a, a good place to uh, wrap up for the day and just um, to say that um, I wish we could <laughs> invite people for tea or for a drink or just to visit. But um, I think that it we've created other ways. We're creating other ways to do that. And I love the uh, chat that's been going on in the um, chat room as as the speakers have been talking. And, and, and it's, uh, it's been a, a lovely way um, of connecting uh, across the distance. So um, I just want to remind everybody before we go that um, you can see these artists work uh, in both the Kootenai Gallery and Oxygen. We have two di different shows, although um, some of Randy's, uh, one of Randy's pieces are in both galleries, but the others um, have um, unique art pieces in them. And we also have a piece by, um, by Thema um, Igaris, who wasn't able to join us for the programming, but it's quite a strong and, and um, interesting piece as well. So I hope you get to the uh, Oxygen Gallery before July 10th or the Kootenai Gallery where our show's on until the end of August. So um, yeah, so again, I just want to thank um, Darren, Jim, Randy, Asiniak, and Keith. I apologize for all the mispronunciations. Um, a copy of this panel discussion will be posted on overburden.ca at a later date. Um, this is our last session today. I don't know about you, but I'm just exhausted. <laughs> so it's a good time to end. Um, the Zoom room uh, will stay open until five o'clock if any of you want to use the chat room um, or actually you could probably 
turn your cameras and, and mics on. Please register to receive a link for tomorrow's workshops and performance um, and check out, you can find those at overburden.ca, although I think both workshops are full tomorrow. Um, tomorrow the Zoom room opens up at 11.15, so you can meet and chat before Sarah's uh, ARIA performance at 11.30. And uh, as I said, um, Randy and Jim and Darren are offering workshops tomorrow, but I believe they're full, although you could probably check in to see if there's space in them. So Randy's uh, leading a work writing workshop at one o'clock called Listening to the Stones. And um, Jim and, and Darren are leading a comic workshop called Storytelling Across Deep Time. And that's at 2.45. And boy, um, listening to all three of them um, today, I, I would love to be in on those workshops. So um, enjoy your evening and we'll see you tomorrow morning at uh, 11.15 or 11.30 for Sarah's performance. And so, um, so yeah, we'll leave the um, chat room open in case you want to talk to anybody. Hmm. Oh, thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow. <laughs> so while we're here, does anybody have any questions or want to continue the discussion? Maybe you can chat. Him. Andrew Godsolve has his hand up, which is oh. great because yeah, I was going to ask, uh, hey, Andrew, what's up? Hey, uh, yeah, not too much. This has been amazing. Yeah, just ideas. It's like mass wasting of the mind. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, geology. Um, yeah. OK, so I was just yeah thinking like one of the threads of ideas that was like really interesting for me was like the idea of the archive. You mentioned like diaries, like having a diary like you know, or a journal like at the end of the sewing pool to write your ideas in, and how that's kind of um, just like and what I wrote down when I was writing there was like kind of like thought thought mining, um, which is what I wrote down. So you can kind of like look at it, like extracting like this ephemeral idea and like synthesizing it into some like thing that has a place in an archive, but it's also like fossilization um, on the other side of it as well, um, which is really interesting. And uh, just kind of a general comment that archive also came up in Sarah's uh, presentation as well. But uh, I found a really interesting connection between the personal archive and the geologic archive. I like the thought mining metaphor. Um, I, I sometimes feel it's a bit like I, I, I don't uh, fish anymore. I did when I'm a teenager. I haven't eaten a fish for 20 something years, but I think of it as kind of like fishing where you toss a line into um, a dark page and then pull something out from it. That's, that's what a lot of drawing feels like. I sometimes think of it as a little bit like a butterfly net too, where I'm like running around in the dark and most things escape, but once in a while you catch a creature and look at what it is. I don't really do that either, but that's the, the, the metaphor. I, you know, not every thought is a good thought, but in order to, you know, and not like every, I have to keep a dream diary. Most of them are really boring, but you have to write down all of them in order to catch the really good ones. Otherwise you just forget everything. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that, in a way, that's the fun part. The hard part is then processing it, refining all of these things that you've collected and sifting them apart and pulling them together. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, kind of expanding on that. Yeah, I don't know, fossilized, fossilized thoughts that Sarah jumping in there is uh, kind of just amazing. Like, yeah, I have like fossils that were cr like living creatures 500 million years ago and were only able to be fossilized in this brief shadow of a cliff, this very particular circumstance happening then. And then our, on our side of 500 million years, there's 
very particular circumstance of just us being able to like feel wonder at these fossils being here like while they're still existing and not weathered away in the short span of like a thousand years um uh, so it, it's just kind of like yeah being able to be there at these kind of very fortunate uh moments of like capturing an experience or a, a life you might be into um, Italo Calvino's writings, the complete cosmic comics, if you haven't read them. Um, no. There's one of them is called Shells and Time. Um, and he talks about how fossilized spiral shells are the reason that humans have access to a concept of time. Huh. Um, I really love that story. Interesting. Yeah. Awesome. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> 